Good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our Cyber Defenders program. Next, we'll hear a conversation from one of our underwriters on the future of managing cyber risk within a dynamic critical infrastructure. Joining today are Lexi Gunther, CTO, Exploration and Mission Systems at Lidos, and her colleague, Josh Wetman, Vice President and CTO with their commercial energy solutions, Lidos Engineering business. Both bring years of experience and knowledge in the IT security and critical infrastructure space. We're excited to hear how their perspectives color the rest of our sessions today. Lexi, over to you. Thank you, George, for that introduction. As someone who started her career 20 years ago with in the energy sector. I'm really excited to talk about the IT OT space today with my counterpart, Josh. And so Josh, we can go ahead and get started here. We both work for Lidos, a large defense contractor, but we have customers and users who cross between the public and private sector and between this IT and OT world. So Speak for a little bit about how that changes your perspective being within the energy sector and how you view cyber defense maybe differently from other teams. Yeah, thanks, Lexi. It's a great question. And honestly, you know, when we think about energy, when we think about critical infrastructure, it's a lot of things in this country and they're not all the same. Let's take the power grid as, as one tangible example, right? Uh, it's certainly national critical infrastructure. If it wasn't before, it certainly has been the last year. And it's actually run by over 3000 different individual organizations. Those organizations have wildly different ranging uh, uh, perspectives on, on their staff, on their skills, on their tools, on their legacy investments. Right? It is not a one size fits all thing. I guess it never really is. So this notion of how do we manage risk? How do we incentivize compliance? How do we manage societal risk of a critical infrastructure set of assets uh, in the private sector? It's pretty different than how we would do it uh, in the federal government, right? Uh, what is the return on investment? You know, there's a lot of broad ranging stakeholders in these organizations right? Uh, what, are, what is their view on compliance? What is their view on risk? And, and I think history is pretty illustrative here. Uh, you know, we have NERC SIP as, as a, a set of regulatory compliance mandates in the energy sector uh, that, that covers mostly bulk electric. The way we, the way we handle NERC SIP compliance hasn't been the best of experiences, all right? Uh, for a long time, uh, for every engineer who was solving cybersecurity challenges, we had two lawyers in the room who are trying to decide what that word means and how do they minimize their, their regulatory penalty, right? There were even organizations who took out digital systems and replaced them with analog systems because they weren't under the banner of compliance, right? So sometimes the private, in private industry and the private sector has a, has a, a little bit of a, a, an odd view or a very business oriented view of managing compliance and managing compliance risk. And that's all very different from how do we manage cybersecurity risk, right? If I'm the CFO of an organization and, uh, and someone comes to me and says, we need $10 million for new firewalls and new intrusion prevention systems, you know, to manage the threat from China or Russia or, or uh, nefarious actors. You know, the first question I'm gonna ask is if I give you that money, Will it solve the problem? And that's where the rub kind of comes in. We all know that it won't exactly, it'll help. It'll help reduce the risk, but there's no, there's no way to just eradicate the cybersecurity problem. And that makes investing in uh, increasing levels of, of defense and increasing levels of risk management hard for the private sector to do. So I think we've got a little bit of a challenge on our hands of how do we as a society, how do we as a group of leaders incentivize the right kind of behavior in the private sector um, without being so prescriptive that we uh, incentivize them to go do the wrong things because it checks the box, right? We've got to find that balance between compliance and actually managing risk. Um, and, and that leads me to, you know, sort of a challenging question for you, Lexi. It hasn't always been particularly easy to solve these problems. In fact, it's probably never been harder, right? With all the advanced pers persistent threats, with all the, the malware and, and you know the colonial pipeline example that just came out, right? This is a hard problem to solve. Even knowing exactly what success looks like isn't particularly easy. What makes it even harder is we're trying to decarbonize 
the environment, right? We're trying to change the fuel uh, that we run the grid on. We're trying to electrify transportation. We're trying to manage all of this massive change. We're rebuilding huge parts of the grid because it's old and falling down. We're trying to keep it standing up and, and functioning. This notion that we can just lock it down and somehow uh, protect it through one set of activities, is just a fallacy. It, it's never going to happen because it's a highly dynamic environment that's becoming more dynamic. So we're going to need some emerging technology. We're going to need some new ways of problem solving that help us address this kind of challenge. And I'm sort of curious, you're well into the, the technology part of this in Lidos. What do you see in the world that's uh, emerging that can help us take on these kinds of challenges? What What's going to build a better mousetrap than we used to be able to deploy in this kind of area? Yeah, I think it's a great question and one the entire industry is really looking at. You also hit on a couple of really key points. And one of the things about how much it is changing, from my perspective, I always like to take advantage of change and make sure that we're optimizing how we're positioning ourselves. So if change is inevitable and it's it's happening right now, then let's see how we can build upon that to build in a more secure uh, and more forward leaning structured and platform to begin with. So a couple of things, um, you had a lot of great points in that opening answer. Um, I think the convergence of IT and OT. So the fact that we've been talking about this convergence for a decade or more, um, but the idea that someone can say I'm physically separated just doesn't hold water anymore. Um, and so I feel like that that is a step towards a change in the direction of cyber defense that we can take action on, right? And so this is one of those opportunities for change where we can take a giant step forward and say it is connected, it is online, it is web enabled. And so as the platforms and the additional sensors and the additional devices are going into our grid system, we can then say, okay, so how are we building it securely? How, how can we make sure that every step along the way, we are building in and hardening these devices and these platforms as much as possible? So I think the idea of convergence being such a strong reality and not just a theoretical example or, or opportunity space is something that we can really jump jump all in on. The other thing uh, that you touched on was this idea of like, how do you how do you lock things down and that that's a fallacy? And I can, could not agree more. And I think one of the things that is really interesting is uh, when we were talking earlier uh, before this segment is this idea of in case, case emergency break glass kind of methodology, right? And so it's really important for us to recognize that if that's that, that is a fallacy that you can perfectly protect yourself and live in a bubble. Okay, we're, we're going to throw out that as a potential reality. Then you have to live in the reality that a breach is coming, it's inevitable, um, or it's already here. And so when you're living in that space, then you have to talk about, okay, then what does limited operations look like? How do I not just build a, a DR or a coop plan to, to bring something back up if it's totally down, but how do I create a segment or limited operations that are hardened enough to continue to operate in the event of a breach. So think about how that could have looked differently for Colonial Pipeline, who when ransomware attacked their IT network, they shut down their OT side proactively uh, in, in for risk mitigation purposes. And I totally understand why they did that. How would it look differently if they would have had the ability and the confidence to say, I can keep limited operations open instead of shutting it down completely. And I think that's the world that we're moving into that we need to be looking at from a defender space, from a management space, from a, a just an industry, is what's this idea of limited operations? So in case of an emergency, you know, what are my break glass options? And I think that's something that you know, is gain again, gaining more traction, but it's also a reality, especially in light of some of the recent events. Um, in terms of just tactical things of what we need to do, we always have to remember that defense starts with visibility. And so if you have visibility into your network, then you're able to defend it. So you can't defend what you don't know about. That's the bottom line. And so this idea of as things are interconnected, as things come online, being knowing it, having visibility into it 
and having the cognizance to say on the operational side of the house, on the OT side, we have to make sure that this is lightweight and we've got availability and safety concerns as our primary focus. And so it can't be traditional heavyweight security um, and monitoring options, but there is a lot out there in the space that has been burgeoning over the last 10 years that gives us access to monitoring capabilities for our OT side of the house um, that is that is really, really strong. And so I think we need to look at how we're approaching our, our building of sensors and platforms a little differently. I think we need to focus on this idea that you can't protect what you don't know about um, and look at this idea of limited operations and you can build that success plan uh, in, in with those items in mind. And so, you know, as we look forward, I don't think it's, I don't think it's bleak. I think, I think there's definitely opportunities for us to take those steps that I was talking about and, and have a risk mitigation plan that makes sense for the OT space. Um, but from your perspective, are there other considerations and, and pieces to take into account? Um, I certainly know things that we're doing on Lidos is side of the house and, and we're building in secure uh, security, I should say, to our platforms and our sensors. Uh, we actually have an entire line that's looking at security detection and automation capabilities for scanning and digitally analyzing um, packages, baggages, um, automobiles, et cetera. And so that we can evaluate the potential risk, hazardous material, et cetera, that is in those uh, carrier items. But how do we make sure that that system itself is secure, right? That is not sending false information that doesn't have the ability to be compromised. And so it's incumbent upon us as platform providers, it's incumbent upon us as industry providers to make sure that we're building security into our devices and our platforms to provide it to the sectors that we support. Um, but from your perspective, what else do you are you looking for that you need? So I think there's a couple of big pieces, right? And this has been true in, in everything I've done in my career. There's an old saying, if you can't measure it, you can't monitor it. And if you can't monitor it, you can't manage it, right? And that's been true of every large system we've ever worked with, but it, it feels it's feels like it's never been more true than, than in this area. So some things we're gonna have to do going forward, right? One is uh, common situational awareness. We have IT tools to monitor things. We have OT tools to, to monitor uh, the, the control and, and process networks, but we don't glue those together very well. We don't uh, get a common view of, of, of what's going on. So we can't really manage both sides of the fence uh, in, in one view. We do it in distinct ways. Uh, as distributed energy becomes more uh, prolific, as we build more microgrids, as the grid becomes more dynamic, we're going to have to solve that problem. We're going to have to have one way to monitor and measure and manage uh, both the normative operations and, and you know, the risk profile. You think about what happened with Colonial, and I love the point you made here. Uh, you know, they, their IT system got hacked, and out of an abundance of caution, they shut down the Colonial pipeline, right? Even the, the malicious actors in Russia purportedly said, we didn't mean to do that, right? It had a negative consequence out of an abundance of caution because we didn't know how to monitor it. We didn't know how to manage it. So I think getting that visibility, as you said, and then figuring out when something goes wrong, how do I plan for uh, adaptive operations? How do I plan for uh, reduced capabilities that still leaves my confidentiality or integrity or availability uh, unconstrained? I don't know, Lexi, do you see a future like that? I do. And I think the executive order that just came out really speaks to this being such an important topic that it, operational technology was mentioned on page two. I think that really lends credence to um, the importance of the topic and the focus it's going to have for us as industry providers, as well as for our customers. Yeah, totally agree. Lexi, this is fun. We should do this again sometime. Great speaking with you, Josh. Thank you, George. Have a good one.